Hello again, everyone. Welcome to St. Jacobus Lutheran Church here in Woodside, Queens. We continue our 16-day read-up to Easter based on the Gospel of Mark. As we continue today, we look at Mark chapter 9, which is right around the halfway point in this Gospel. Jesus has done a lot of miracles, healings, had confrontations with the religious authorities, performed signs of power like calming the sea and multiplying food. Jesus has cast out all sorts of demons and evil forces in the world. Jesus has restored people to life and um, gathered this group of followers who he sent out to continue and do this work together with the people of God. So now, Today we read through Mark chapter 9. For those losing track of what day of the week it is, today is Sunday, April 5th. And I'm going to read uh, from the New Revised Standard. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as that no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a, crowd, then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked Jesus, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man, that he is to go through much many sufferings and be treated with contempt. But I tell you what, but I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, Why are you, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out but they could not do so. Jesus answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And they brought the boy to Jesus. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood, it, was, it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, 
You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him, and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked Jesus privately, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind can only come out through prayer. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is to, betray, is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him and three days later, after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what Jesus was saying and were afraid to ask him more. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they, were, they were, had argued about with one another over who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be the first must be the last of all and the servant of all. Then Jesus took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives, a cup of, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ, will by no means lose their reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and where the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted, with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The word of the Lord. Now that wasn't exactly the most comfortable reading to hear. I think there's three things to sort of look at. The first is this opening scene of the Transfiguration. This event is usually marked in the church calendar right before the start of Lent. It serves as a reminder that the exciting miracle here isn't this moment of Jesus glowing with this heavenly, undescribable light up in the sky with Moses and Elijah. The miracle here is really a reminder that this is the same Jesus who was present with people every day in their suffering, listening to the people who were sick or harmed or hurt, wondering what would happen next in the world, and Jesus assuring them that God was present with them and that God loved and welcomed them and each of them was cared for and part of the kingdom of God. The transfiguration gives us a glimpse of the glory that was present with us here on earth in Jesus. 
It gives us a glimpse that God's promises are true and good and kept. It reminds us that Jesus truly is God with us here in the world. Now, Peter wants to make little um, buildings, uh, sheds or tents to commemorate this moment so that they can stay on the mountain so that Jesus can go and get transfigured in the temple and transfigured out among the religious authorities and among the people and go to Rome and be transfigured there. This is the moment of power that they have been waiting for. Now, Jesus, in all his shiny, bleached glory, can go and do this work. Nobody's ever going to doubt what Jesus is talking about, that he's speaking with authority when they see this. To the disciples' shock and confusion, Jesus not only tells them to shut up and not tell anybody about it, Jesus tells them to wait until he's risen from the dead. Now, they completely misunderstand this as well. They have no idea what Jesus could possibly be talking about because they are on this road to glory and there's no death on that road. There's no suffering and struggle and persecution on the road that Jesus' disciples think they're taking. We move on to the next scene where Jesus walks into a sort of like a big confrontation on the street between Jesus, the disciples who didn't go up the mountain with him, and this crowd of people. Someone recognizing, knowing, understanding that these were the disciples of Jesus and that they've been out in the world healing and curing people and exercising demons said, hey, my boy is sick. He's been sick forever. Can you guys help? And Jesus' disciples go, well, yeah, of course. And they do what they've done dozens of times before as they went out into the world to show the power of God. And they can't help. Uh, for some reason, this particular demon is not responding. It's not listening. People have suggested it's because the demon cannot talk and part of exorcisms were learning the name of the demon so that you could address it directly. Perhaps this was just a stronger demon than they've encountered, or for whatever reason, Jesus' disciples can't do it. Jesus comes, and of course the father, concerned about his son's well-being, says, well, they can't, but maybe you can do it. Jesus responds by saying, well, yeah, of course. But Jesus also invites this man to do part of the work, to, to have that faith to believe that this is possible. And the man says something that I think we're all often tempted to say. I believe. Help my unbelief. He truly and honestly puts it in God's power and God's hands. He says, I, I think I believe as, as much as I possibly can. I need God to do it. It's a moment of trust, of dependence, of humility, and recognizing our place and our struggles and our very humanness of doubts and fear and anxiety. So Jesus goes on to heal this child, to restore the boy to wellness, and then Jesus again has this confrontation with his disciples. Not only are they missing this whole death and resurrection part, not only are they missing this whole persecution and suffering and things like that, now they're arguing with one another about who's the greatest, about who's going to get the shinier rewards, about who's going to have rule over a bigger territory or more important place and all these other things. Jesus, we're told, sits down to talk to his disciples which at the time in the Jewish tradition was what a rabbi or instructor would do to speak with authority. When somebody sat down, that meant this is important. You better pay attention. And Jesus talks to them about this call to serve, to care for others, to be present with people. He, Jesus lists this example of a child. Now, at the time, children were useless. 
they were not able to contribute anything. They weren't part of any of these relationships that society sort of revolved around. They didn't have access to power or they couldn't help you do anything or stuff like that. So for Jesus to pick a child and say, you must accept the kingdom of God like this dependent, like this child who depends on his parents for everything, who is not capable of going out and getting a job and, you know, doing all these different things because you're a child. If, even if you could, nobody would give you a job. Jesus is inviting the disciples to think about their work and their calling differently. Jesus is inviting them to consider this work of service and sacrifice, of showing we understand God loves and cares for and sacrificed for us by doing it for other people, by showing communities God's love and God's power through showing love and power, through doing the work that Jesus sends people out to do. One final note, and this one I've never been sure of, no matter how many times I've read through this um, gospel or this chapter. At the end, Jesus talks about, you know, cutting off your hand to avoid going to hell and plucking out your eye and doing all these incredibly horrific mutilations of your body. And part of it, it's not life advice, so don't do it. But part of it is to stress the seriousness and the importance of what Jesus is talking about. Inviting people to take the gifts of God very seriously and the grace of God very seriously. Inviting people to think about how we rank things in our lives. There, it's, it's a call to remember that all things belong to God. It's a call and a reminder for each of us to be thankful for God's grace, but not to take it for granted, not to forget it comes at a cost, not to forget that when you hear, see, experience, or part of this good news, it's meant to change you. It's meant to take over your life. It's meant to direct you and guide you in this care for others and care for yourself and this joyful desire to share some good news. Tomorrow we move on to Mark chapter 10. And in chapter 10, we again see these conflicts between Jesus and his misunderstanding disciples and the religious authorities. All right, we'll see you then.